Good morning. This is the, the last of the morning presentations, and I'm going to try to keep you engaged just for a little bit less than 20 minutes. Is that right, Hal? I'm, I'm going to keep it as tight as I possibly can and introduce a, um, an emerging technology uh, that uh, I think is of interest to practitioners. And this is on behalf of Daryl Baumgartner, who is an uh, expert in optical particle recognition that I'm learning a, a lot from in this endeavor. And notice up there I have practical in parentheses, and uh, what this uh, technology is about is about distinguishing between ma major bioaerosol classes and then drilling down um, within any class, bacteria, fungi, or pollens that we care about floating in the air and try to determine who they are, count them, and so on. So um, the, this concept of, of aerobiological load, in total, what what bioaerosol is floating there. And in working with practitioners this year, I was on sabbatical. And these were the questions. And uh, these I ran into engineering. It doesn't mean if it's in water, wastewater, or aerosol. And that comes to how many, who they are, where are they what, in, in, a, in a structure, and what's their biological activity. And we've touched on every one of these uh, questions uh, here today, both from the building science side and the molecular ecology side, and even in, in terms of biological activity being po positive or negative. In some um, instances, there is inference that uh, exposure can have positive biological activity over our life. That is, if we have certain exposures when we're young, when there's a dog in the house, we, we have a protective effect. And then, with, of course, with the, in terms of pathogens or allergy, there's a negative effect. So there are all these questions that we're trying to, to get to and, and assemble a toolkit to, to get to. And um, they really boil down to this acronym, identity, distribution, activity, and abundance, if we, we make a composite of all these questions. So we're going to get at least to one of these uh, acronyms, and that is or two of these in the in the acronym here, and that is distribution and abundance. I'm going to use this acronym PBA, Primary Biological Association, or Primary um, Biological Activity, several times through this. And what we've heard this morning, we heard from Mia, we heard later from Jordan, and again from Martin, is this idea of ID. And right now, um, many of us are, are leveraging next generation sequencing, DNA, to get us this faster, cheaper, and with more confidence than we ever could before. And to some degree, we're using this as well, um, not only to tell us who, but how many. So as we move from the identification sphere to the abundance sphere, how many, we can use DNA. We're not as confident in using DNA to get down to absolute numbers. And there's never a substitution for counting. And in the aerobiology, world, and Tina introduced this, is we went in with a microscope and counted who was there um, by taking a long enough in, uh, sample, knowing what our sampling was, and actually looking under the microscope and counting. And the microscope doesn't lie, and, and what we're trying to do is leverage automated microscopes to be able to do this for, the, for us with some degree of confidence. The last sphere is about activity. And we heard also how we sample affects viability and what we want to get to, and we were introduced this, this morning as well, what are toxicological aspects of the aerobiology that's associated with the primary particulate matter that's floating around us. So to get a comprehensive characterization, it's this sweet spot in the middle of who, how much, and what's the activity. So what this talk is about really is getting to systematically challenging all these spheres and fundamentally looking at, oops, what did I do here? Where is, Francis, can you help? Oh, there we go. Is fundamentally, fundamentally looking at what fraction of the airborne particles with some high degree of confidence are biological in nature, and can we use optical signatures as we used to with microscopy to get there? And this technology is called laser-induced fluorescence. It's what this is really about getting to the question of abundance and to literally brute force count what's floating around and classifying that, both in lab and environmental samples, with optical technology. And the platform I'm going to introduce to you is one form of a bioaerosol sensor. I use the term wideband in this sense because this bioaerosol sensor sorts by size 
counts by scattering, as most optical particle counters do, but in addition to that, can see fluorescence in three different visible wavelengths. And the wavelengths are up here. I won't go into what these are, but essentially this is a portable UV microscope that sizes, counts, and source sorts based on fluorescence color in many different ranges. <laughs> this particular version of it does single particle integration at a reasonable flow rate on the order of what samplers do now, can sort in size ranges that matter to us, bacteria through even pollen grains, has um, a capacity that can process large amounts of particles in reasonable volumes in reasonable time frames. So that's what's coming out. This, is, this has been evolving in the military sector and now it's translated into the civilian sector. And really what these are, are aerosol cytometers. And I'll use the term next generation because that's what we're doing with DNA and other things. But really it's been around for a while and there seems to be a version of this emerging on every continent. The Asians have one. I understand there's one coming out of one of the Finnish groups called BioScout. There's different versions of these around. So um, as an engineer, I'm, I'm pretty excited about using, using this, but also cautious about vetting it out. And the way this works is we want to look at natural and artificial aerosols that we either generate or that we can, in a room like this, just simply sample at a reasonable flow rate to get a reasonable uh, representative sample during many residence times, okay? And not only do we want to get uh, size segregation information, in this case we want to get fluorescence information that are related to the origins of the bioaerosol. And uh, the way I relate this to practitioners are RGB. They can, uh, the people that I work, the industrial hygienists, understand red, green, and blue. And essentially, that's what this thing does, is it gets color spectra associated with different bioaerosols. So what we did in the lab was what we've done with chemistry, what we've done with DNA, we build a library. And this library was built with aerosols of uh, medically relevant bacteria environmentally and medically relevant fungi, and environmentally relevant pollen grains. So these are aerosolized in the chamber, and spectra, size information, shape factors, absolute numbers, and how these look when challenged by a UV microscope with at least three bandwidths, RGB, how these present, and are there patterns that emerge that help us identify or associate with the phenotypic, not genotypic, the phenotypic process or, or uh, properties of these airborne um, particles. So that's, that's the idea here, is, is to just go in and brute force do this, take some time. And here's a reduction of at least some of pure culture bioaerosols that we've used to build this library. So I'm gonna take a minute and go through this graph uh, kind of slowly because it's got a lot of information in it. On this vertical axis here are the percent of the airborne particles that produce a certain spectra. And that spectra is broken down into size, which is proportional to the width of the bars. And these different colors are the different types of fluorescence. Red, blue, green, RBG, and combinations of red, blue, and green. If you have three colors, you have seven possible combinations, okay? So with each different type of bug, these are pollens, these are fungi, these are bacteria, we see patterns emerging among the bioaerosol classes for the most part. So for instance, the fungi have a large optical diameter, at least as judged by scattering, and most of the fungi are dominated by a type A fluorescence. They only fluoresce mostly in the red spectrum, okay? The pollens group differently. They seem to fluoresce more in combined color spectrums or more in the C spectrum and so on. So these, these obvious patterns start to emerge and we can be very quantitative about building these catalogs, just like we are with chemistry, just like we are with DNA, okay? So that's the idea, is there are combinations of optical diameter, size, fluorescence and light scattering that allow us to build these libraries and maybe, maybe for the practitioners, we can come back and use this for a reference. So that's the idea. 
if you take the data from that graph and, and boil it down into the three main factors, that is the, the fluorescence intensity that you get for a given optical diameter and the fluorescence type, what color or combinations of colors that you present, they group quite obviously. The pollens have marked fluorescence with larger diameters, the fungi in the middle, and then the bacteria are smaller with a different type of fluorescence. And maybe we can come back and reference this in a real environmental sample. That's the idea in terms of progressing this to practice. So what? Okay. So we've got this library, now we've got to go to the field, because that's what the practitioners want in their hands. And in my year on sabbatical, um, we've been doing this. And uh, Jordan and I were talking just in, in the back in between presentations, and what we want to get both with the genetic analysis as well as any estimate of biological loading is what's normal, what's abnormal. What's normal following water intrusion, which is a lot of the focus of what we do in terms of generating indoor bioaerosol? How do we begin to understand all these three spheres together, leveraging this type of information? And as always, how many observations are enough? It's never enough, right? The more we have, the better off we're going to be, and the better we understand the context, that's where we want to go with this. And so, with the help of practitioners, we went to the field with mobile versions of these aerosol cytometers in six different metro areas. Each one had a technician that was trained in its operation, trained in how to baseline it, calibrate it, and so on. And in parts of the uh, eastern, southeast United States, Washington DC area, the Dry Mountain West, and our Southwest, in different seasons, we went and took observations over many residence times in many different res residences and commercial environments um, with these cytometers and went and compared the data. And you can see these data sets at least are getting large enough that we have some confidence in building distributions from them. And that is in fact what we did. As we just saw Martin do with the qPCR, so we did with total particle counts in all sorts of different types of rooms all over the US, and you can see these log normal distributions start to emerge in terms of total particle counts. Here is the fraction of the total that's fluorescing, all right, or has some fluorescence that's akin to what we saw in the biological libraries that we have built. And then you can take this and gate that for any room, for any microbiological type. We're going to take this fluorescence type and gate that for just the part of the library that are most like fungi, or as my practitioner friends would say, mold. Mold, that's what they call it, at least in, in many parts of the United States. And you can see which each gating, when we go from total down to fluorescent concentrations, we drop an order of magnitude, and then we're gonna drop um, a fraction of an order of magnitude when we gate that for mold concentrations. And you see one thing, or a couple of things drop or uh, immediately come apparent. One distribution is lower than the others, and this yellow line corresponds to commercial office environments. They tend to be lower than the residential environments, and within the residential environment, this distribution pops out, and that is the entrance to the residences tend to be higher than the other when we're looking just at aerobiological load as reference to the library of 35 common fungi with those optical diameter and fluorescence distributions that we saw. So, does this become useful? Okay, that was the next question. That is, if we gate to fungi or if we gate these distributions to whatever aerobiological class that we want, does this become useful? How do we envision using this in practitioners' hands? And that's what they wanna know. So, if we take a sample from somewhere and we can qualify that to season or building material or region, type of construction, whatever it may be, we can start to pick off places on this distribution. We can take a sample. We can see where that sample lands, say in the foyer or a bedroom or a kitchen, whatever it may be. Then look where it falls on the rank order and ask the question, is this an outlier as we define it? And we as practitioners or you as practitioners have to define what that's going to be or we're all going to have to work together to determine what an outlier is. Coming back to the conversation Jordan and I have, what is normal? 
How are we going to define that? Is it a standard deviation? Is it two standard deviations? Is it when, uh, when a log normal distribution breaks from linearity? When are we going to call something an outlier in terms of biological load? And we can do this with ecology too, right? We can make distributions of dominant members of bacteria or dominant members of fungi for a given season building type and relative humidity condition, whatever you want, and we can build these. And when Jordan said big data this morning, I think that this is what he was referring to. We're going to have to get into big data sets to get to this question of what's normal or what are we going to find as a threshold for normal. And um, I've been uh, in in the lab for a long time. And this year I was on sabbatical and I got to go out to practice. And some of the industrial hygienists I was working with started calling me college boy. And uh, they were right. They said, so what now, college boy? How are you going to make this work? And the question is, I don't know. Um, and what I do know is we're not talking enough, that the practitioners and the academics are not talking enough. And I hope conferences like this are going to start to build, bridge this issue. Because what I have learned is what I'm learning in the lab and what's happening in the field are, are two very different things. And this, this translational bridge has to happen. And I'm excited to see that it's beginning to with pilot studies like this one. So I've got four minutes left. And I'm going to seal this up with getting to this idea of bridging these two worlds, the molecular ecology world, where we get patterns of what you saw Mia present, what you saw Jordan present, we get patterns of, mo of molecular-based ecology, relative abundance. And now we can juxtapose that to real-time particle counts based on fluorescence or the microscope or whatever, each one of, this is actually from a, a real study in a, in a hospital, each one of these dots represents a combination of fluorescence factor. This blue blob of dots are likely bacteria. This red blob have patterns that are consistent with the library of fungi that we built. And these dots, the DNA was extracted from these and we were able to build a relative abundance plot and we can juxtapose or superimpose this relative abundance over our actual count and begin to, to actually assign, hey, it's those dots from which we pulled the DNA. We have a real count. We can check with connotative PCR if we're even in the same ballpark and start to do these things where we have independent complementary methods to give evidence that our methods are actually working. So that's where we're going with this and I hope um, the practitioners can use this. Moving on now to the discussion about DNA and um, Tina brought this up, we have to know how to sample. And how you sample affects your result. Not only that, how we process affects our interpretation of results. And what I'm getting a lot from the industrial hygiene sphere is how do we get from sample to this confident interpretation of community composition. And when we start with the DNA world, that is, the industrial hygienists have an idea of clean, clean sampling. We use an aerosol cassette or a button sample or whatever it may be. But DNA clean is different than clean. And to a practitioner, what they've told me was, oh dear, that means training. You have to teach me how to, how to sample for recovering DNA, which is different than how I sample already. And it's serious training. Then there's wet bench work, which can be outsourced. Okay, right now industrial hygienists, at least a lot of in my country can take an, a filter sample and just outsource it, outsource it and get to community composition via microscopy. And they use these for, for sample assessment. In the way, however, with this DNA processing is bioinformatics based on heavy computations. Okay, and they asked me, well, how do you do this? And I said, well, there's a lot of different options to do this and there is a whole alphabet soup of different processing pipelines and subroutines out there that I'm learning about. And I, as an engineer, am guilty of black boxing this. There's one called VAMPS, there's one called CHIME, there's another called MOTHER, and they're, they're all kind of evolving either through uh, single pipeline analysis or shotgun DNA, which you need a lot of, but they're all evolving in different paths and they have different processing paradigms. And like sampling or like the box that Martin just put up, 
right? We have to know what we're doing with this as they translate into the practitioner sphere. And I, as an engineer in the research sector, barely understand what's in these boxes as I use them, and they're complicated to use. In addition, these processing pipelines that get us from sample, from once we get DNA sequences to, to the interpretation, rely on different databases. And they have clever names, Green Gene, Silva, RDP, but which pipeline you use and reference to which database, which are curated differently, may or may not give you a different answer. And we're not sure of the resolution of these answers yet. We use them, we report them, and we have to be careful to qualify to the practitioner community that I use a certain pipeline and a certain database, and my results are qualified to that pipeline and database. And Jordan brought this up this morning in the very first slide. We haven't standardized. We haven't chosen in and among ourselves in the research sector which pipeline we're going to use, which database, so we can compare results. We have to sample the same, we have to process the same, so we can talk to each other about that. So that's where we are with it, and I'm going to turn it over to our moderator to um, bring us all together to talk about it.